So good evening, everybody. Um, my name's uh, Trevor, and it's my great pleasure to be standing here in person and uh, virtually to talk to you a little, little bit about how we as BT Labs are looking at how do we take, how do we harness the power of discovery-led research, the fantastic work that's done here and across the country, and translate that into something that creates unique capability in the market for both us as a company and for the UK. Why is this so important? Why am I talking about discovery-led research in the context of commercialization? And the reason for that is the labs are an applied research function. And we look very much at this trinity of um, key components in what do we focus on in terms of innovation. And it comes from our very foundation uh, as, an organ as an organization. But the key being seeing how did we create effectively from brand new science in the context here of electromagnetic theory, the application of that science with real world, real world engineering in terms of turning that to the telegraph. And then how did we then create unique differentiated service that was protected through patents and intellectual property to create a sustained market advantage, not only here, but globally. And BT has been at this, the lab's been at it for quite some time, say there, 1837. But rather than look on the history, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing today. And the labs are, massively successful in terms of inventing and creating new intellectual property, not only in sort of fundamental physics, which is one of my passions, but also we are, you know, the UK's strongest in terms of things for AI patents. And we punch very much above our weight in terms of filing those inventions compared to our peers and others across the country. But what I want to talk to you about is not the creation of those patents. For although in itself, it is an incredibly notable achievement to, afford, to achieve a patent and that volume of patents um, in the market, it doesn't actually deliver you anything in the market. Now, before we talk about it, I could actually go through this, and I don't know how many people are familiar with technology readiness levels. And the reason sort of interested in this is we start here in this great sort of great university in the cross country at, at TRL1. Fundamental physics, fundamental math, science. This is the very achievement of finding something entirely new and novel and fascinating. And that's really to just effectively even to predict the existence of something and have a concept. As we apply effort and build knowledge, we progress through to TRL2. We talk about building a model, a, a theoretical application. This is the defining paper, the seminal paper that we all aspire to publish to say, this is how it works, these are the models. And then we find, and that's very clear, as lots of people, many, many in the room have published and will be working at that level. We then sort of come through to lab proof concept. I like to think of this one as proof of physics. This is the experiment on a bench, um, you know, be it an optical table or electronics table or a simulation, which is the equivalent of something held together with gaffer tape and sticky tape and basically held together. But as long as it proves, at least twice the thing that you're trying to measure or understand to validate the theory that you've been working on. And in many cases, this is a jobs done, phenomena proved. Um, we move through, but we, in order to say, how do we turn that into something new and prototype of application. This is really your first real world type prototype. It's a black box, which is constrained. It's maybe portable and it's actually proven against the use case. So for us, we might have a really novel piece of electromagnetic theory. 
this would be the first black box you could go and take out into a field and do a measurement with. And then we become more and more applied. It becomes better and better engineered. And you progress through to something here, which is actually doing the job against a real world use case that is designed for, it's ready for production. And all the way over here, once it's progressed to that, is something that can effectively be deployed, can be sold, and people can use. And hence, when we reach that point, and probably nowhere in between, we reach our pound sign. Now, for us, as a network company, our default model over the years has been to come up with a good idea, to collaborate, to use collaborations in Parliament, and then say, well, the best way for us to achieve something we're going to use in the network, be the next broadband service for you, or a new mobile technology, or anything else, in order to achieve the volume of, in, and therefore the price points that we need, we need to go to international standards. And we effectively gifted a lot of that knowledge away in order that other people could implement it and then sell it back to us after it had been built by people like uh, Nokia and Cisco, Ericsson, et cetera, the, the huge vendors who would then present us with a global product that we could then deploy um, and deploy this in the new service. Now, that is the way it's functioned for a long time, and it is a beautiful model, unless you want great differentiation, because the downside of internationally standardized global products is that anybody else can decide that you've built quite a good thing. They can go and buy the same product from the same vendors in an open market and deploy that. And so you might get an early mover advantage, but what you ultimately see is that erode quite quickly as others implement almost exactly the same thing that you have deployed. And it's something that's meant immense challenge, especially when you're the labs and you've invested so much effort here, you've been a national champion, you've done everything that you should do, and yet others who don't invest into the ecosystem don't get, get to almost exactly the same benefits from having doing so. Now, I'm a believer in what these, so these things called loon shots. I don't know if anyone's heard of this particular one. I'm not going to take credit from it. It's, um, you know, Safi Brokol, but it's ultimately, it's beyond a moonshot. So a moonshot, effectively there was the moon, it was decided that there was going to be a race. We were going, the Americans were going to land a man on the moon. It was a defined target. People resonated with it and it was going to be incredibly hard and challenging and expensive. And we didn't quite know how to do it, but at least people, resonated with the idea they thought ah yes well we should go to the moon that's you know that seems sensible a loon shot is the other way around this is something so crazy um, that when you tell people about this brilliant breakthrough that you've had that's going to change the world they look at you as if you're ever so slightly peculiar um, because it's either a new product or technology that no one believes is going to work or it's a strategy or business case that no one believes is ever going to make any money. And quite often these require the serendipitous combination of technology or business model or external factors. But I find myself, about, as I'm doing these slides, found myself reflecting. Back in 1837, how many people thought that that wonderful device was a solution looking for a problem? That same thing that we're told many, many times. And, but yet our lives are defined by crazy products that either people said weren't going to work or had crazy business models that would never function. A few examples, I'm not gonna talk through them in great length. One I particularly like is the concept of um, highly desirable flat screen TVs you have based on organic LED technology. A technology which was, uh, I didn't realize until I was researching it, another one of, that Kodak developed that, uh, well, invented, but didn't bring through to market. It was a technology which was incredibly difficult, didn't really work, had low yields, you know, needed billions investing in it. And even the giants like Samsung 
abandoned it because they just didn't see why you would continue to invest in a technology that was basically not as comparable to the LED technologies of today. Samsung gave up in around 2012 on OLED technology for very large screens. LG persisted despite the fact that most spectators said they were mad to do so. OLED was never going to work. Think about the burning. Think of all these other issues. Now they have a unique section, segment of the market, highly desirable, protected by IPR that only they in the whole world can manufacture. Many said that Amazon were insane with the Kindle. You have a business built on selling books. So why on earth would you then effectively completely change that massive profit center and create electronic devices? Tesla back in today, completely self-evident is the way forward. 2004, not so much. Another company that went bust, nearly went bust a number of times as it tried to develop the technology, which became self-evident 15 years later. And one down the bottom, I thought I must touch on mobile. One, because this one knows the iPhone, despite the fact it was a two GPRS device when it launched, it didn't have the mobile internet in the way it did, but transformed the segment. And one which I felt a little bit sad of something before its time. Um, this is a project Blue Phone from BT from 2005, I think 2006. This was the very first commercial product that did voice over Wi Fi which of course now is something that everyone takes as something default that works on all your modern devices. But back then, didn't quite have the right serendipitous combination of events to follow it through. So this is where I'm gonna divide the audience. So put this as an echo from the past. And this is a voice band modem, dial up modem from, uh, um, which is how we used to connect the internet. And when I first joined BT as a graduate, one of my first jobs was to go around the country and talk about broadband, this weird technology that would have the internet going at speeds of 500 kilobits per second and would let you do things like surf the internet, watch TV on your computer, and do all these things that you never knew you were going to do. And we literally had to have TV adverts with dinosaurs and people, video games characters fighting in Liverpool Street Station to try and convince people there was a thing. So when I went around the country, telling them people this is something they could have, guess what? People looked at me as if I was slightly peculiar and said, why on earth would I need such a technology? Um, and they referred to their dial-up modems. Bizarrely, BT didn't think it was gonna sell that many either. Um, you know, back in 2002, it was probably of the order of a few million connections if we were lucky using these wonderful, adorable USB modems, which many will have forgotten. Broadband rolled out. And then there was a clamor for more broadband, and this one will resonate um, with, with Tim because he was very um, closely involved with this. So in 2008, OpenReach decided to announce that there's these things called super fast broadband because, you know, technology moves on. We need the next transformational step. There's things like 4K video and video conferencing and all these sorts of things that people would want to do. And we only tipped our toe in the water. So we decided to roll out to about 40% of the country, expecting you know, a less than universal take up um, than that. And uh, on that day, the market was they rewarded us with a 10, a 10 P drop in the share price because they thought we were crazy. Um, but today we have a network that spans 28.8 28 million homes. There's over 16 million people connected to it. And I, for one, simply do not understand how we could have survived the last 18 months without a network that no one thought they needed. Which is effectively when the investment started, exactly where we were. And now we're deploying full fiber to 25 million homes. So having talked about one of the loon shots I've effectively lived through, 
how do we make it reproducible? And one of the things that uh, probably started about three years ago was the foundation of a new team called Network Physics. The idea that we would, as an applied research department, come even closer to universities to the discovery led research. And we would effectively look broadly across that for new theories and developments that we believed could be translated into a communications use case. So ones we could actually quite honestly say, could we create a, could the, the test being, could this piece of research be translated into something which is of a business benefit that's worth hundreds of millions, if not billions? How do you go hunting effectively for network unicorns? And the idea would be that they would look at very, you know, great array of different technologies, find out which ones were applicable, which ones would have a return, and then effectively establish the IPR associated with those so we could take it to market. And that job was effectively to build experiments built with sticky tape on desks in order to prove the physics of what we're trying to do in a telecommunications use case. We then realized we needed another function, which was breakthrough prototyping, because we had the same challenge that we do in universities. How do you get from a really cool theoretical proof, an experiment on a bench, and take it to a state where people will believe? How do you wrap a first proof of application such that it be a black box that you can then take your stakeholders and go, look, see it, does X, it receives light in a new way, it can, has a much greater sensitivity. And effectively, the idea we've built here is almost, or we're aspiring to, is how, do, how does BTS itself act to create that very first prototype such that people can see it, they can touch it, they can start to believe in it, and therefore you can accelerate through um, the other TRLs. This is something that, so we've probably been at for the next last couple of years. But the idea being, if we follow this journey, we're not sort of gifting it away to get it built. We're then working out how do we partner with others, be it UK SMEs or other entities in our innovation ecosystem and across the partners and indeed, you know, potentially with universities as well to create something that is then unique. And we can then go on to build and then actually realize that truly sustained uh, advantage because it's been developed effectively all the way from discovery through. Now, I won't stand here and say that this is, this is new, you know, some brand new concept. People have been trying to do this for decades. And indeed you can see um, a numerous examples, you know, um, which have, you know, your, your, your Xerox Park and you see various other entities which have you know, created world changing technologies. But we believe this is the only way that we're sort of actually building it and going and actually trying to say, only focusing on the ones that can make a genuine difference to us as a company, um, will we make this work. Now, so that's the why. Probably worth just talking about a few that we're actually, we have been looking at and continue to look at. The first is that, and a couple of here we've been working on with the university. So we start, one of the ones we started off here was surface waves over copper. So working um, with uh, uh, Tobias and others to say, actually, given we have this overhead infrastructure, could we use near lossless surface waves in order to deliver much, much higher capacity compared to uh, systems today? Um, the short answer is following a fantastic piece of work that's so being submitted for publication um, now is yes, you can simulate it to be able to carry tens of gigabits per second. Um, but this is one I'm not going to talk about today, but it does absolutely work. Low cost coherent optics. How do we find a cheaper, more effective way of taking full fiber from the two and a half gigabits is today to 10 gigabits, 50 gigabits, and then into 100 gigabits and up towards a terabit per second. And yes, before anyone asks the question at the end, 
why on earth would I need 100 gigabits per second or a terabit per second? I'll say, you don't, but just wait, because that always becomes the answer eventually. And recently, BT has also published, it's building the UK or the world's first sort of quantum secured network based on QKD in order, you know, that's in order to prove the value of utterly secure by proof of physics networks. But the ones I'm going to talk to you a little bit about are these two, uh, Rydberg sensors and robotics. And Rydberg, um, so I love this project. This is kind of one of the very first ones that we have ushered through from having fine. So today, if you're receiving an RF signal, you tend to use a magnetic dipole. And uh, they are situated on very large, very complicated multi-element antennas are now deployed in tens of thousands of locations on cell towers and in millions of other places for other technology. And we were looking for something that could create an advantage in the receiving of those signals. Now, this is something that is, uh, you know, it's actually, it's been, it's now currently pre-published. We're just waiting for it to be published in the uh, uh, journal of Lightwave Technology, so I'm not giving any way too secret, but we became very intrigued with the concept of electric, electromagnetic induced transparency. The idea that by taking rubidium and actually focusing two different wavelengths of light, you could place it into a Rydberg state tuned to, say, the 5G um, wavelengths uh, frequencies we're using today at three and a half gigahertz in order to make a receiver. Because if you could create something out of a Rydberg sensor, you wouldn't be limited by the thermal noise of a system. You'd be limited by the quantum noise of that system, which might be worth many, many dBs. And that means capacity or it means fewer transmitters. And so we, pers we pursued the working theory of this to say, how would we create a dynamic system that was capable of using the EIT effect to receive a signal. And you can see on this side of the slide, our gaffer tape and wires and various other bits on an optical table. Um, and we have actually proven the phenomena. So you can see here the capture here, that's a relatively low, low board rate. The, when you transmit the signal at three and a half gigahertz, it's received by the Rydberg sensor. The electrons come out of the state, they cycle down. That means that the laser light passes through. So what you've achieved is direct modulation of laser light for an RF signal with no electronics involved, which built in the right way could give you some really transformational use cases in terms of how you receive signals, and both in terms of its distribution or its sensitivity or just being able to do it in an environment where it's not suitable to have electronics. And uh, also very proud of a member of the team who got uh, you know, a Royal Commission exhibi exhibition of 1851 um, sponsored PhD off the con concept of say quantum optical receivers. And you know, truly proud of the fact that this is a technology that we believe could be quite transformational that BT working with universities at the discovery led research stage identified the potential of this. And we are pursuing it to try and create the first sort of working proof of application, which we're hoping that if we can build a box that does what it says on the tin, it will become self-evident as to why it could be so powerful. On the other end of the spectrum, who doesn't love robots? Um, so one of the big challenges that OpenReach has is around the deployment of full fiber. And today we are getting, uh, building like fury is the, uh, is the term of phrase that our CEO uses to reach 25 million homes. But the UK has more than 25 million premises and some of them are extraordinarily expensive to reach. And so we decided to ask a different question. Today, that cost is driven by civil engineering. It's driven by men and women with big tools digging up pavements and drives and causing much, much disruption. And, uh, and surprisingly, people don't necessarily enjoy that disruption. 
Um, and so we thought, surely there must be a better way. And what we did was again, coming back to the low TRLs, we found that there was literally nobody looking at the use case of applying robotics to telecommunications. You could find it in nuclear reactors. You could find it being sent to remote planets. You could even find it going down water pipes. But for the, develop the delivery of broadband infrastructure, which could have such a massive impact on GDP, no activity at all. And so we set upon, upon actually doing two things. One, working very closely with the universities and our own prototyping team to, to develop a number of proof of engineering prototypes, be it very small drills, be it um, pieces of plastic that jiggle in order to actually um, be able to transcend vertical and horizontal connectivity. <clears throat> and my favorite, which um, I haven't got on the slide, which is anyone who uh, can recall uh, Thunderbirds and the mole that was deployed. Imagine that made very, very tiny with a 3D printer installed in its behind it so that it, it digs through the ground and prints a small subduct behind it ready for you to be able to push the fiber through. Many people have looked at me as if I was crazy when I said that, and maybe that's slightly true. Um, some of our senior management have looked at me and said, I'm slightly crazy. And again, that might be true. But we investigated that. But critically, we also built a, this time a facility almost to act for translation, because this wasn't about could, was there some really cool robots in, in academia and industry? Yes, there was. Could we, could we create a realistic environment where people could bring those devices to trial and to understand, to apply to our specific use case, such that we could actually prove the viability of a number of these technologies, use that facility to bring in partners who would be able to look and say, actually that's something they're interested in building, and you know, engaging with and then our own eco innovation ecosystem with small to medium enterprises to develop those technologies. Not only for us, which is you know, great for the UK, but this is not a unique problem. This is a problem the world has to solve. In many other markets, tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of euros and dollars to be spent on digging holes in the ground to bring infrastructure. So this isn't just about, you know, delivering benefit to OpenReach and the BT Group. It's not even just about the UK. It's about there's genuinely a new section or segment that we can pursue that could be incredibly profitable for all three. We did find that the media really quite liked our robot lab. Um, I think about 30 separate articles written a few weeks ago. Um, and I have to admit, it even triggered me to buy my first newspaper in very many times. I had to go to the news agent and buy the copy of the Daily Mail just so I had that for the slide. And the idea here really is these, these are just two examples of things that we're doing, really going fundamentally back to those low TRLs. And the reason we do that, as I said at the front, there's something to be truly transformational in the terms of the product or the service you want to offer. It needs to be unique. And the only place that that genuine uniqueness comes from is the discovery led research at the very front of the, of the process. And it's absolutely critical that we do that and that we bring our strengths as an applied research department to say, not only do we understand all of the cool science and why it's exciting, but to be able to translate that into something to understand why it's good for BT as a company to invest, and then for us to become the advocates to pull it through to create that new technology that will create enduring commercial success, which nobody else can copy, at least not for a good uh, 10 to 20 years after we've had a go at it. And with that, I'd say thank you very much. Well, thank you.